Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Justine Huang, and I will be your host today for this panel on addressing Asian racism from the inside out. One in two Asians in Vancouver have experienced some kind of racism. That is 50% of Asians. Last year alone, there was 98 reported counts of anti Asian hate crimes, and that's only of what's been reported. That is eight times more than the previous year. And that number is three times more than New York City, which is the leading city in the number of reports. Before we, be we begin, any conversation around justice has to involve an acknowledgement of the land that we are on. If it was not for the careful stewardship uh, of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, I would not be able to be here today to have this conversation. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge our ancestors who have paved the way in leaving their homeland in order to come to a new land in order to give their future generations, and that is us sitting here around the table, uh, to be able to even have conversations like this. I do want to give one more acknowledgement to Jesse Sutherland, a dear friend of mine um, who runs Intercultural St Strategies. And she recently created a training called Addressing Racism from the Inside Out, um, where there was a number of voices sharing their experiences of how we can deal with racism as a bystander, as a target, and almost most importantly, racism within ourselves. And so I want to acknowledge her work um, and acknowledge that this title was inspired by her training series. And there's a, a bit of a double play on the title, um, the words here. We as an Asian Pacific Islander and South Asian community, um, we are inviting you in to join us at the table here today as we address this conversation from the inside of our community outward. But also it happens, the common de denominator between all of the people at this table today, except for me as the host, um, all the others will be speaking as professionally trained therapists with lived experience. And so we are going to be looking from a mental health perspective at the topic of racism. And so we are going from the inside out, knowing that while we do need to have systemic change, systems are made up of people who live within them. And so we also need to look at racism on the inside as well. We do want to thank TELUS for prompting this um, panel um, and for wanting uh, to amplify our voices. We're so thankful for this opportunity and we hope that it is going to be helpful to you in your journey wherever you find yourself. Thank you to the viewer for being here, for tuning in to this hard conversation, but essential conversation. We know and acknowledge that it's not easy to do this, to do this kind of work. Before we got on this call, each person at this table acknowledged that we are struggling and we feel like we are just beginning and we feel like we have so much to learn ourselves and we don't feel qualified to be here but we know that that is not true every person has a voice and has a perspective and has experiences and so we welcome you to come as you are and so we do invite you also to just be present and to tune in to what's going on for you as you listen we need to have this conversation more broadly. As a daughter of Chinese immigrants to Saskatchewan, being the only kid in a French immersion class, um, there was always that sense of being just on the outside. And there was also very much that sense of wanting to do my parents proud um, and in a cultural upbringing where we were not really encouraged to pay attention to our emotional awareness. And part of it is cultural, part of it was just the times where we just didn't have nearly as much research and conversation around mental health. 
And so what that can do, what that did for me was it created a very externally oriented, performance oriented life, which led me to lots of wonderful opportunities in maximizing every opportunity that I was given, feeling that extra weight of responsibility of I need to take, I need to, to be responsible with every opportunity for education, for instance. But that also led to multiple burnouts. And it was in the process of self-diagnosis and self and recovery. It was through a community of people that helped to give me language and taught me what I just did not have um, in my early years. And so this conversation is important to me as a communicator, as a trained facilitator, realizing that language is the beginning of awareness. This particular panel came especially out of some conversation circles that we recently held and will continue to hold. They were, they are conversation circles where people can come together and through conversation and guided creative practices and reflective practices begin to actually practice using their own voice in articulating their thoughts around different issues and their own experiences. And what was so surprising coming out of that was this common theme of, I've never had space to talk about this before. I have never looked at my identity in this way, my cultural identity in this way. And we didn't realize, many people in the room didn't realize how validating it was simply to have a room full of people nodding as they shared their story, knowing that these um, experiences that they had were not, uh, they were real and they were valid. Because something that comes out of my own story, uh, as someone who is in an intercultural relationship with a Black man, it is so easy to do what I call comparative suffering. Well, the little things that I've experienced, they're not as big a deal as what he is experiencing and is continuing to experience. So I don't want to take time away from that. Collectively, we don't want to take away from our Black brothers and sisters because we know the, the struggle for liberation there. And so we hope this conversation is going to be a starting point for that, for you to explore your own cultural background and where you are in your journey. We are all in process and we invite you to just come as you are. And with that, I want to introduce our panelists or give them, invite them to have a chance to introduce themselves. Hello everyone, my name is Ying Yiya in Chinese and uh, uh, in English, just Yiya Yin. My family um, it consists of just my mom and my dad. I'm part of the one child per family policy of China. And uh, they immigrated to Canada from the US um, in 1989. And that was the year where I left China right after the summer of the Tiananmen Square massacre and incident. And um, it was a very tumultuous and confusing time for my parents and family in China as well. Um, but it was a decision that forever changed our family's destiny and identity. Um, my first nest in Canada was uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, but echoing a lot of uh, similar immigrant family experiences, we, tra we traveled and moved a lot from uh, Halifax to Ottawa to Nepean, having gone through four different schools um, within communities that had a high ratio of both immigrant families and also refugee families in Ottawa. Um, it created an amazing experience and upbringing in which I was invited into the homes of families from Cambodia, from Vietnam, from Somalia, from Ethiopia, and um, gave me a really incredible um, warmth and awareness and in building friendship through other cultures. Um, later on, moving into uh, Vancouver, I, it was the first time that I felt like a majority uh, in a population and in a society where um, Asian culture was not just visible, but even more celebrated um, and also implicit in that kind of a shift in even within one country from Ottawa to Vancouver, 
that there was a, a sense in which I also have to be more careful of my privileges being seen as a Asian woman. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of my um, movement into the counseling field, I had in my uh, late 20s encountered some very severe complex trauma and um, you know what a beautiful way in which I felt um, through the suffering, through the grief, um, uh, I felt the divine creator gave me an opportunity to um, enter into a place of powerlessness, um, seeking support for the first time from a place of vulnerability from a family, from my community of faith, from my uh, therapist, and from groups such as Al-Anon and um, other support groups from churches, that it started to transform my identity um, and awareness of that I was a person that really did come into an Asian schema of sorts in which seeking help is something shameful. And we are to be as strong as iron and bite our bottom lip and go, go forward no matter how hard um, and suffering a certain circumstance was. And so many years of coming into recovery, I became very inspired to move into um, the therapy um, uh, career as a way to both transform my suffering into um, redemptive support for clients and for support groups and also as a way to embody and live into the truth continually fighting for the truth of who I am and fighting for also the next generation of young women and men who are just beginning to catalyze um, their awakening and how they want to renegotiate their previous identity perhaps a lot of it inherited or enforced onto them and coming into a place of decision-making and agency. Um, I now run a private practice called Behold Counseling. And um, I also have a huge passion in the arts as a painter, as an illustrator, um, storyteller, and um, also dabble in a bit of music. So I really enjoy that aspect of also using art to art and music to help mediate the healing process, to help use um, colors and shapes and compositions to form maybe certain ways in which we can't use words to describe um, our grief or um, even positive emotions that we, we really want to exude out of us. Thank you so much for your presence here at the table today. Joyce. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Joyce Jokio, and I um, I identify, or I am a cisgender Filipina Canadian woman, and I um, was born in the Philippines, um, so I am an immigrant, and I moved, I moved here when I was three years old with my family, and um, into the lower mainland, we first lived in Vancouver, I went to university here, but after I graduated, I um, I ended up in the United States, in the US, and I spent a lot of my um, young adult, early adult years here, or in, in the States, um, in specifically out East in Philadelphia and Camden, New Jersey, um, working in the field of social work and um, program development, um, working with youth. And so, that was a real transformative time for me living in the States. And it um, really opened my eyes to um, issues of race. Um, I was really naive in my thinking that, you know, there was no racism in Canada or cause it was so, you know, it was very multicultural. It was a mosaic of different cultures. And living in the, in the US really opened my eyes to how blatant, um, racism, prejudice, and bigotry was. Um, it was quite eye-opening um, to just um, seeing friends being racially profiled, stories of police pointing at guns to, you know, to friends who, because they looked like a criminal that they were looking for, 
even myself being racially profiled when I was driving my car in an affluent um, neighborhood. Um, and the police ran my plates and saw that, I, you know, that at that time I was living in Camden. You know, experiences like that really um, just opened my eyes um, to just um, the reality of, of racism and, and seeing friends fight it out there. And uh, it's so central in conversations and, and people's lived experiences there. So I spent um, my time there. I was there for about 12 years. And then I moved back to, um, to BC. The experiences of working in, with children who've been traumatized with tra complex trauma and foster care um, just really had me, it just inspired me to just go back to school. Like, I mean, that was one of the reasons um, um, to, to, to work at a, on a deeper level with children and other individuals. I am currently working as a child and family therapist and um, trying to build my private practice on the side. About over a year and a half ago, I think COVID, the pandemic, and um, just all the just rhetoric, like the ignorant rhetoric that was being played out on the media, it just, you know, it, it just, it just brought out something in me where I had to start speaking out and I, you know, and I started doing a lot more reading and having conversations about race. Um, I have historically, I've had like this love hate relationship with my own culture. And I've, um, for most of my life, I've had like this negative aspect and my narrative was more focused on the shame piece that was really deeply embedded in me. And so, you know, I really had, I've, I've been working on confronting my own internalized racism. And cause you know, I've adopted ideas, beliefs and actions and behaviors that have supported racism. And that's been used against racialized individuals like myself. And so this is something that I have been working on in myself. I have become passionate about uh, working with individuals um, and just centering my practices around the intersectional narratives of racialized um, individuals experiencing mental and emotional distress. Um, racism, you know, it's a, it's a mental health issue because it causes trauma. And, um, and trauma points a direct line to mental illnesses. And this is something that needs to be taken seriously. I want to be able to give Sneha a chance now uh, to tell us your story. Hi, I'm Sneha McClincy. I am also an immigrant, um, but I did not, I was born in India, but I grew up in the Middle East. So I was an expatriate and that's where I lived um, most of my adolescent life, childhood and adolescence. And then moved to Canada when I was about 17 and uh, decided that that couldn't be home for too, too long. So then I moved to the United States, which is where I live now. Uh, in essence, uh, my experience has been of always growing up as other. And um, uh, even when there were people that looked like me, I knew that I wasn't, I, uh, I was a second class citizen. It was just knowing that where I lived in the Middle East, that I wasn't a, um, a person of consequence. And um, I had to toe the line and there were certain rules that you learned quickly um, so that uh, the powers that be, you didn't, you didn't come to their attention. In any event, I moved to Canada and I thought actually very naively uh, that um, there was no racism, right? I, I, I was now in a place where I could uh, be myself. Uh, I, I came of age uh, literally in Vancouver. As I think about my own uh, journey and exploring and embracing my own racial identity, I realized that I'm still exploring and I'm still embracing uh, parts of my identity. I'm not, I'm not sure that I've uh, fully avowed all of the parts of being Indian uh, or all of the parts of being an immigrant uh, or a person of faith, a woman of color, a psychologist. Like, I don't know that I, uh, I'm fully avowing all of those identities, but saying all that to say that uh, my, 
where I started was that racism happened in far off places like South Africa <laughs> and maybe in the UK uh, and um, in the Middle East, but only to people who were not understanding what their place was in society. And my sense of racism was that it had to be something very overt. What I realized is that that was my own internalized racism talking. Um, and so that's been a journey in the last few years. And part of that was going through grad school and understanding the psychology. Um, and um, learning how I myself have um, kept that system alive and also how I have at times, though not understanding, have been targeted in that very same way. Um, my whole life has been weaved around uh, this ideology that I didn't even understand. I remember hearing for the first time uh, about uh, that the, that the standard was whiteness and remember feeling just even in my own self, feeling enraged, like how dare you say that I have been contributing or subscribing to an ideology that I didn't even, uh, I wasn't conscious of, but I realized now that that was defensive, right? Um, and it took me some time uh, working it through I, I cannot say that I was unafraid. <laughs> I was very afraid. Um, but in, in the time that has passed and working through understanding that if I am afraid to look, um, I cannot help someone go to the place where I am not willing to go, right? And if I, if, not if, when it is happening to one of my brothers and sisters, um, it's happening to me. And if we want a better world, we've got to look at the hard stuff. And this is hard stuff. Thank you, Sneha, for not <laughs> avoiding this conversation, though there might have been some temptations to do so. Um, earlier, we talked about how we don't, it's hard to face things, mm -hmm. um, especially if it really came out of left field. Mm -hmm. um, and it's already coming up so richly in your stories. And I'll just add one part of my story here because it really was rude awakening. Mm -hmm. um, and it speaks to Joyce when you were talking about, and, and Sneha too, your stories of, oh, well, we did, Canada's really not that bad. It's part of our public image that we're proud of, that we're multicultural, which is a political construct from the seventies. Um, but realizing that even though I had been walking alongside my black boyfriend in very big systemic injustices and feeling the impact of that. Mm -hmm. um, the, after the first one had cleared up, the second one, not three weeks later, the next one came. And mm -hmm. in my fear, I literally said to him, what are you doing mm -hmm. that is causing this stuff to come towards you? Like mm -hmm. it was his fault. Right. And he graciously mm -hmm. pointed out how offensive that was to him. And I caught myself and I was like, that's like telling a woman if you had walked a certain way, if you had changed, if you had a different, uh, if you were smiling or if you weren't smiling or if you're wearing dressed a certain way or not, then maybe this wouldn't have happened to you. But even then, I still didn't see the systemic nature until Black Lives Matters. And I'm mm -hmm. not proud to admit that, mm -hmm. that it took, even though I was actually experiencing it up, well, not me personally experiencing it, walking alongside um, some of those injustices in Canada, it wasn't until Black Lives Matters happened where I was like, oh, this is part of something much bigger. And so, I hope even as we share these little pieces of our lives with you, um, as you listen in, that when we talk about systems, 
and then also just our own as human beings defense mechanisms uh, that protect us from the hard places um, we're it's uncomfortable um, but it's essential that we rise up and do this work now. And whenever I tell those stories in detail um, to close trusted friends, most people are like, that happens in Canada? We're in denial in some senses. Like I've been binging on all the conversations in education uh, around uh, this topic. Uh, a lot of them are American um, and, and there's a lot of parallels that we can learn from. Um, but I, that's partly why I'm excited to have this conversation in the Canadian context, because there's a whole other layer of like self-delusion uh, that, <laughs> that can happen here. Um, and thank you for your bravery, all of you, for, for speaking honestly um, and being, being willing to do that. And that shame and honor piece um, that drives our um, culture so much, it's a bit of a, a catch-22, right? Because I am comfortable, I am getting to a place where I'm comfortable talking publicly, but I'm still very guarded in not naming specific people or conversations that I've had because I don't want to bring, I don't want to bring shame to my family. Finally, but not, certainly not least, um, Hingzi, can you share with us um, your journey? I am Hingzi Lobretsky. Uh, I've started using a lot of my full name when I can everywhere I go. Um, and uh, I am the daughter of Chinese immigrants from Hong Kong and so um, sort of the Southern China area. And uh, I immigrated when I was about four years old to Calgary, Alberta. So you can imagine coming from South Pacific and then, <laughs> you know, never seeing snow in your life and uh, so much whiteness and it was snow and the people. I think my experience has come in such a way of understanding my identity, who I am now, all these things has been sort of a lifelong sort of process too, because, you know, when you grow up in Alberta and uh, I, I guess the theme and the awakening for me is just um, this proximity to whiteness right, and not understanding my, how my own racial identity was pretty much covered by the sense of needing to be as white and close to whiteness as possible yeah, in, in order to not be othered, right, in order not to be ostracized, and in order to survive. And I have seen that and been grappling with that more and more. Because in some ways, the tension is I owe so much of who I am now, the relationships I have, to a lot of really wonderful white people because that was most of my friendship groups growing up, you know, at school and things. Um, and also the bosses who've given me opportunities. And then I was shocked because I moved to Richmond. So all of a sudden you come from Calgary where you're sort of like that token um, Asian person to uh, sort of like Yia's experience, right? You move and you're like, oh, wow, oh, there's actually lots of people that look like me. Well, it's kind of cool. But then the, the shock for me was I didn't identify with them because a lot of the Chinese uh, kids that I went to school with were like straight up, still spoke Chinese, were really proud and they watched like Asian movies and things. And I, I didn't, I couldn't relate to that. So it actually made me move closer to just like finding my more white friends. And then my family moved out to Abbotsford because of my dad's job. And my experience as a person, I had to start over again in new ways. And it was just like this constant challenge of trying to keep up with like, who am I actually? And then constantly defaulting to, well, I can be as white as possible because that will get me through. And, and this is all subconscious. Like I'm now able to find the words to explain myself. But back then it was just like, okay, hunker down and try to appear as not Asian as possible. So fast forward into university where I ended up, you know, being able to meet people from around the world. I was also able to um, teach and live abroad. And, um, and I also volunteered with sort of a faith-based organization at the time. And it didn't matter whether I was in Latin America or when I was in Africa, people would automatically throw all their stereotypes. So I was prepared for it. I was prepared for it, 
But at the same time, it is still shocking because you realize, wow, like globally, when you are under um, a particular racial hierarchy that you didn't even know existed, you're constantly trying to climb the rungs. In the last few years, I had a mentor who was biracial and uh, who was really involved in anti-racist work in um, black spaces and white spaces and sort of in the lower mainland that I was starting to learn that there are so many policies and things um, and laws at place that I was oblivious to. Because same thing, I sort of just saw, look, I'm handling racism from an individual level and I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, not realizing that the system at work was so huge and large. And we have so many things in place, like the system, the institution of education, as critical as it is, to be an equalizing factor um, for young people to have a chance at, uh, of opportunity of living their best life as well, so to speak. I was realizing there were so many things set up as a system to not allow them to be successful. And so that's what got me into teaching, but that's also what got me into counseling. And so now I do that as a day job, but I also have um, uh, my little private practice as well where I service uh, clients, you know, from children to teens to adults, but I'm moving into the realm too now where I am supporting um, a lot of just professionals in their field, leaders in their field who are starting the work of understanding themselves as racialized people, how they are, you know, going to move into changing policies in their workplaces, but it starts with themselves as all, um, all the other therapists have mentioned before me, like working through their own internalized racism, owning their racial identity, and then doing the work outside. We're now gonna be entering some, some hard, hard conversation, like some hard topics. And so I did wanna to say to the viewers as well, that it's really important that you take care of yourself at this time. There's going to be topics and words and events that we will share, and maybe we've already done that, but that are going to trigger or raise really uncomfortable feelings in your body that are going to bring you back to your own past. And so I just want to encourage you to, if you need to take a break, to pause, to come back to it, and to also make sure you have ways of taking care of yourself after you've watched this is to whether it's to speak to professionals and also to contact your own supports because this is not to be done alone and this is just the beginning and so i just want to encourage you to take care of yourself i know we took longer on the stories but the stories are the content a, a key part of the content understanding that we are trying to move from unawareness and maybe even avoidance and an absence of being a part of the conversation not even realizing oh this is a conversation that hey i need to i need to be there um and in hearing your stories um you all have begun to bring to light in recognizing okay now we're moving into this awareness piece and then we will move to action and advocacy when i first started my own recovery work and really making a lot of apology for what my parents like i i couldn't even acknowledge that maybe there was some gaps um, in their parenting so when you use the word trauma can you just define what that means? Because I think it sometimes can bring up this sense of like complex, heavy, intense stuff. Trauma <laughs> is the response to a deeply distressing or disturbing event that overwhelms an individual's ability to cope, causes feelings of helplessness, diminishes their sense of self and their ability to feel a full range of emotions and experiences. I like that definition because it doesn't say you fear death, you fear being raped. It just says it was deeply distressing and it made me feel helpless and I felt conflicting emotions, right? So I think that part's important. We're not talking about capital T trauma in the sense of post-traumatic stress disorder. 
um, or some sort of clinical diagnosis. We're just talking about it as an impact, as an um, as an experience that I had that made me feel less other, disembodied, disavowed, invalidated, et cetera. Wow. Does anybody else want to briefly just comment on that? Because I feel like that's a that's an important language yeah. piece. I think like for my own, like for my experience of trauma, it's been, it is more emotional, mm -hmm. which really affected my sense of self and who I was and like my self-esteem and how I viewed myself, the worth and value that I had in myself. And so, you know, a lot of times, and I'm, you know, I know there are people who can probably identify with this, like just, um, people like my family, for instance, like, I mean, I love my culture, my, my parents and, you know, they, they did their best with what they had, but is, is more of, um, just not allowing me to, um, the trauma of like shrinking, like that's like, for me, that's trauma where I just wasn't allowed to speak my voice. And I, and every time I spoke up or voiced a frustration that was viewed as being disrespectful and I was punished for that. I just wanted to say that, you know, trauma in the past, like originally, right, came out as like a specific event, like if people mm -hmm. experienced war or, you know, natural disasters. But what the research is showing now is that you're right, tr trauma can happen um over time and it's when your body and your brain are overwhelmed and stressed and unable to make sense of a situation in a way that is uh what we call like uh like adaptive right like or we do adapt but it's in a way that that ends up just for you to try to survive something so in any ways it's it's a relationship with an experience right and and that's why no two people experience something in the same way. You could grow up in the same household and be spoken to in the same way, but one person will internalize that differently than the other based on how their body and their brain and their nervous system receives that. So trauma can show up in, in, in various forms. Yeah, I totally agree with Henzi and um, also just wanna add that trauma alongside the idea of like, it could be a very visible event um, you know, that it, 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 it can be explicit and very visible and very messy, but also it can be compounding very, um, very much in a family system where particularly Asian families where you have to read the implicit all the time, right? Mm -hmm. It's the invisible loyalties, it's the invisible strings that mm -hmm. um, we're triggered by that compounds us in the way that it affects our nervous system, affects our health, um, mentally, emotionally, physically. And, um, and so um, sometimes an implicit trauma in which uh, we as a culture generally are just reading everything implicitly, like in the air <laughs> within a family situation or a social situation before uh, in a way that other cultures may or may not have like as their default mode. Sometimes it makes it even more difficult when the struggle is is so hidden behind the veil of the safe face mm -hmm. culture, the honor and shame culture. Mm -hmm. Super helpful. Thank you. I just, I feel like that's such a key piece of this conversation uh, moving forward. Can you speak a little bit, I'm going to open it up to any of you that want to answer this one. Can you speak to what's kind of like neurologically, psychologically in our bodies? What's happening that prevent makes it so hard, even it, when we might even be in a place where we want to do the work, but then we find ourselves just subconsciously avoiding it. Your amygdala is talking. <laughs> and tell us about the mist, the amygdala. What is that, and what's okay. the role of it, and what's going um, on there? So. Uh, the amygdala is responsible for uh, the emotional uh, processing in your brain. Essentially, that's, that's where all our feelings um, are being activated, uh, so to speak. And um, so if we are feeling fear, that's where it's coming from. Uh, and also, 
um, it is the it's one of the quickest responses. Uh, it's meant to be life preserving, literally, right? Life preserving. And uh, so it kicks in quickly, we might not realize it, uh, we might be in full blown, whatever emotion we're feeling, right? Usually a negative emotion, it's, it's meant to be protective, it's activated when we are feeling unsafe. Uh, and so <laughs> I, it it's, uh, it's, it's a bit difficult, maybe necessarily even to identify uh, until you're away from the situation to re recognize, oh, I was scared, um, I was uh, upset or distressed by that particular event, interaction, etc. Is there something practical that we can do when we notice ourselves doing that or later on we realize, whoa, what just happened, you know, in a certain situation or conversation? Personally, I'm a, and professionally, I'm a big fan of validation, um, that it is okay to feel whatever I feel. Um, but sometimes if we're not even sure what we're feeling in the moment, to take a moment to consider what it is that you're feeling. Of course, if you're not in a safe situation and I'm running away from a tiger, I'm not going to take a moment to say, I think I'm feeling unsafe because I'm running from the tiger. I'm just going to run, right? So, um, and unfortunately, there are, um, lots of situations uh, for BIPOC, so um, people of color, uh, to have that experience. And so you are, um, I'm, I'm not suggesting for, I'm not suggesting that you take a moment and consider if you are safe or unsafe. If you feel unsafe, you need to get yourself away from that situation. And then um, first, my, my recommendation would be to validate because it's that we are part of the system that is invalidating of our experience. And so that's the first pushback to validate and affirm that that's actually my lived experience. I totally agree with Sneha and just so, so like feeling the pulse of that because the validation piece, the permission piece is one that I think Asian communities um, and families really have not come into a deeper, maturing, robust muscle memory about. Mm -hmm. um, like in terms of like bringing into an embodied experience of what the question you're asking about the what's mm -hmm. happening to us. Um, so emotions are made up of like the internal and the kind of external reactions. Um, so the biological changes, for example, um, there was a time where I lived in Holland as an international student. And that was the most explicit racist encounter repeated compounding encounter that I had, that there was um, a gentleman at the academy that was a, a, a printer technician. And every time I went to uh, ask him for support in printing something for me, um, he would look at me in a way that I've never experienced before in Canada. It was, uh, it was quite shocking for me and the, probably one of the most culturally shocking things I've ever encountered in that uh, international studies. Um, and repeated after time and time again, I wasn't sure why. Um, it was uh, in my body, I was feeling like all of a sudden shrunken down. My heartbeat was racing in the fact that he gave me that look and um, just walked away and ignored me time and time again <laughs> as, a, as a Caucasian uh, Dutch man, quite big uh, in terms of physically. And I remember also, even now I'm feeling it again, um, noticing just the, the fast heart rate, the sense of like looking around and not just being confused, right? Mm -hmm. And feeling my body kind of want to turn into a, a, a little ball, like those insects that roll into a little ball just to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. um, having the fight and flight response actively, like, you know, feeling anger rise up. But here's the thing. So in in, in much of my experience as an Asian woman, when those sensations start to surface, how I bought my body has learned to cope with it, cope with these ex external triggers is that then I feel this weight over my chest and over right about my neck area where I just, it just burns. And it's like lava, hot lava wanting to come up and like rush and explode. Mm -hmm. But then like, a steel elevated us like, mm, 
you know, not operational, going back to ground mm -hmm. floor at like a very slow but steady pace. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, internalized racism as we come into the permission to feel maybe the delayed response from years mm -hmm. of compounding encounters with racism that I haven't really allowed myself to validate, but now am, um, has been quite uh, a, a revelatory grieving process mm -hmm. and so the permission piece like uh and the validation piece that Sneha is talking about um includes like explicit racism but also a lot of our like disenfranchised mm -hmm. grief are, and um absolutely yeah and just to explain this to the audience so <clears throat> how i understand it um it, disenfranchised grief is kind of like grief that isn't socially acknowledged so that for a lot of Asian communities is that we as a community haven't acknowledged it until now much more publicly. Um, and um, disenfranchised grief also is like perceived grief that seems like not relevant enough, not uh, intensely, uh, uh, um, the, the, the level of suffering isn't intense enough. I just, I just wanted to respond to both what Sneha and um, Yia had um, shared. And I just think it's really, like I loved everything that the both of you had just shared because um, a lot of people just don't have the language, right? And to have, um, <clears throat> to and they're just not aware of the language. And especially when it comes to embodiment and just the emotions that we feel in our bodies. Um, like it's just like for myself, it's been in the last few years where I've been focused more on how are like specific emotions are attached to our bodies there's a fear you know on that individual level like you said in our bodies that we feel but also because i think what we're learning now too is that the brain is a social organ right and so it's constantly seeking safety it's constantly seeking belonging so racial trauma, right? Like when we, it's, it's, it's on a personal and it's as a collective, right? And so that's why it's so complex. And that's why this conversation um, can be so, it's, it's so hard for people to hear, right? Because when, when your brain is like saying, you're, you're, you, it needs to find safety, but the thing is too, the brain, when it thinks you're in danger, it's gonna go straight to, right? That emotional, limbic part and the thinking part of your brain actually shuts down. And so that's why for people who are oppressed and also for oppressors, it's like there's reactions that happen where it's not the rational parts of our brain that are communicating with each other. And so hence like time, the grounding is so important to feel, but also recognizing why it can be instinctual, like, like it's like we don't think about it and we'll just react. And so I think it's so important for our viewers to understand that it is okay. You are probably gonna have those reactions quite often, but it is just knowing that like we need to be more aware of them and how do we handle it, but not feeling not 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 feeling like you're gonna have to master this. Like it's a, it's just something that we're we're gonna like sort of figure out at some point because it's it's constantly happening, right? And from and in in the most like sometimes unexpected, like at a printer for a year, right? She's just walking into a store. She's not out in the forest looking for any sort of danger. So I think really, um, yeah, just knowing that piece. Let's just systematically go through these four responses. When, we, when we're talking about fight, flight, um, freeze, fawn, then that's what's happening in the moment, not what's happening after the fact, right? Yeah. Um, that's that's what we're actually yeah. describing as your like your quick go to. I didn't think about it. This is what I did. Yeah. Did you guys ever uh, see that report of the Chinese granny that was attacked and she hit him back with a cane and like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be a great example. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Yeah. That was perfect. definitely a fight. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's a good example. Yeah. Uh, freeze, I think that's self, pretty self-explanatory. I do nothing, right? I try to make myself invisible. Yeah. Fawning is what we would call a people-pleasing response in trauma, in the moment. You know you can't leave. You know you can't fight. 
but you're not necessarily frozen or dissociating. And so you are really nice to your threat and you play nice and you do everything possible to get out of it by being accommodating and pleasing to the person or the threat. With the purpose of making the threat diminish, right? That's right. To yeah. either to be yeah. safe enough to get away mm -hmm. or to reduce the threat. Correct. Yeah. And, and there flight was... would be leaving. Flight is also internally where you feel like you need to get out as well. Like it's, mm -hmm. you may not be able to physic, but you like you start planning as well in your mind, which I think is a little bit different than just freeze where you're numb and you, you're not, you know, whereas flight can also be like, I got to figure out how to get, I'm going to escape this way or that way. And, and so there's a bit of an escapism uh, to that response. Can we talk a little bit about these four things, but not in like a overt threatening targeted way so say for example you're having a converse a hard conversation with somebody what does what do these responses look like in that context because i've caught myself for example you tell me which one this is where i'm listening to someone and i'm like like i'm literally shaking my head I turn off my zoom camera and i'm shaking my head but then i'm not saying anything because that's my way of my body's just like eh, nope not doing that can we talk about in though in like lower threat but still threatening conversations for different reasons can we talk about what those look like because i'm thinking of these hard conversations that people are going to start trying to have with family and friends and coworkers who don't see the same thing so essentially i mean i i took that example and there was a flight aspect to that right you shut your camera off like I don't want to interface with you. And then there was also a freeze component of that. I don't know where to go. I am overwhelmed right this moment, right? It didn't make you, it didn't activate you to do something. It didn't activate you to plan something. It activated you to just stop, right? So you shut down. Well, and even I think that it's all the, as the conversation continued on that path, I was like, and when I started to come back to, I was like, but I make, I'm making a choice to not engage. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to rock. I don't want to get into this argument with this person. So I'm just not going to, mm -hmm. I'm just not going to do that. So th I think there's the fawning. Mm -hmm. Heck, mm -hmm. all of the things, mm -hmm. all of the mm -hmm. things. Yeah. But yeah. I do actually want to follow up. A qu I have a follow up question for you, Joyce, because I know that you have done more work personally in grounding yourself in stressful situations. I work um, in a program here with the school district as a child and family therapist for uh, children with complex trauma and neurodevelopmental disorders. So a lot of, it's really hard work. <laughs> and I also support their families as well. And um, a lot of this work, you know, families who come from hard places and a lot of intergenerational trauma. And, um, and I have a wonderful clinical program coordinator who has been walking through the last year and a half with me um, doing somatic work, um, somatic experiencing. And so when I'm talking about somatic work, it's learning about my body and how the, the, where the emotions are in my body and where I am feeling um, stress, um, even my own trauma in specific aspects of my body and not just trauma, but even joy and helping me um, just see the different, um, like all the emotions that I feel in specific parts of my body, helping me to just really ground myself um, uh, with different um, grounding exercises and encouraging me um, and allowing me to take up space, like in terms of width and length you know, grounding, it's not so much, it's not done so that grounding and centering, it's not done so that you can feel better. That's like kind of, there's a misconception that grounding and centering is supposed to make you feel better, but it's more so that you can feel, it's so that you can feel more. Um, grounding, like it helps you feel more. It helps you identify the emotion um, and the feeling and where it's connected um, to your body. 
I know that naturally it's going to bring up white supremacy. Now, I want to actually like face that head on because I, I was very uncomfortable with that term when I first started hearing it. It made me very, very uncomfortable. I just kind of avoided it. White supremacy, you know, I want to just credit um, Layla, Layla Said's book, Me and White Supremacy, because a lot of my learning started with her because she breaks this down. And I recommend to our readers or reader, sorry, viewers to read. Oh, Sneha has already given the promo. I love it. Yeah, right there. A really critical book. I think it's a, it's a foundationally will set the tone so that um, people can get like a sort of a basic understanding and then build on it. So in, in as simple terms as possible, white supremacy is not just, um, you know, we think of uh, men wearing towels over their heads and, and bed sheets. Like it's not just Ku Klux Klan. It's not just those men, uh, you know, men and women, white men and women holding tiki torches and wearing swastikas. It is, uh, in a sense, it is a philosophical sort of worldview. It is a construct that whiteness is at the top of the hierarchy. It is in which you get privileged based on your skin color, in this case, to have access to power, to wealth, to land, right? And so it is, uh, it is this idea that you, you get to do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, wherever you want to do it, because you're white. And so there are people, like even folks of color, that benefit from the system, right? And hence myself my closer the proximity to that, to whiteness, the better. And so that's just sort of a general breakdown of, of white supremacy, right? And it's that idea, supremacy, meaning you're at the top, you are the best, right? And so why white supremacy has to be dismantled and looked at, right, is because that is what create, they create the narrative though, that anything not white is essentially not good. It is other, right? Other people then are, you could, you could demonize, you then create all the stories, right? When we use the word narratives, it's like all the stories, all the mythologies, all the things that allow us then to make patterns and judge other people are based from that, from that initial sort of statement of, you know, white is best, white is innocent, white is pure, right? And so white is powerful. So all those, well, these are just sort of an example of, of like defining white supremacy. White supremacy, and as it sort of exists, as we sort of know, it's in the last few hundred years where race became utilized for various reasons, right? Lumping people based on skin color or like certain, certain cultural factors and all. It, it, it is something in the last few hundred years as imperialism and colonialism began, right? Out of Europe, when they started having to go elsewhere to find resources to, to right, for their own folks, they had to start doing that. And they had to justify why they're going to do this. And so white supremacy can show up and impact different people groups different way. And so that's why we have to talk about it because as Asians, we were impacted right, differently than the, our Indigenous peoples of, if I speak strictly to North America, right, Turtle Island, um, it is different than for the uh, Black folks who were, you know, brought over under, for, for slavery and exploitation. So white supremacy, it can impact us. So some of the terms, right, is that the slavery and capitalism is one of those pillars, right? So for Black folks, it was the idea of, they were being used as slaves, right? They were enslaved in order to make money for the white settlers. Whereas for indigenous folks, it, it came across, right? A lot of it was genocide and colonialism. Like, and these all have intermixing plays, right? But we have to, um, we have to be able to start this conversation that racism isn't this one blanket thing because that is often what we see in the news, right? Oh, racism. And, and we always talk about it from those individual things, but structurally and systemically, everyone's impacted differently. So for indigenous peoples, it was straight up genocide, cultural genocide and, 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 and physically, right? Killing them um, in order to take their land and to be justified in that. Which brings me to the model minority sort of um, idea is that it, 
it was um, Edward Said's work on Orientalism, right, and war. So for those of us who identify as Asian, like it came across that we are threats, right? So we need to assimilate because we, it's always other and we're gonna go to war with your countries out there uh, because you don't belong here. And so that is how racism can show up systemically differently. And so, cause this is gonna lead into our action part I know later, but I, I, we have to acknowledge that, that as we talk about anti-Asian violence now and model minority myths, we have to really also understand that, that there's been, it's bit, white supremacy is built on anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity. And so where we fall as identified as Asians is sort of in between those binaries. And so we are complicit as oppressors and as the oppressed within that binary. And when I say binary, it just means like those two opposing sort of forces. And so if we don't understand this, even to start with, it's very hard for us to take action. It's very hard for us to even reflect because we don't know where we stand. And so for me, it's also been like learning a lot about my own history in this. But anti-Blackness, right, is pretty much just based on the fact that like when I said white, right, is like the best, is superior. Uh, blacks, blackness is inferior, right? And it's this, uh, there's a, and, and it's dirty, it's not innocent, right? And we see this played out in, in so many narratives, right? Same with Indi for Indigenous folks, anti-Indigeneity, right? It's this, they're, they're lazy, that there's, um, you know, uh, there's their violence. It's just like they, the way they're described, there's so much of that. And we have to understand there's a demonization within that. Because as Hengzi was talking, I, I was thinking about how the United States is not actually, or Canada is not the only place in the world where we're seeing this, right? Um, and in fact, um, we've seen this in South Africa, um, right? Uh, the, the European settlers went over there and then um, the Dutch, I think it was. Um, and so you go over there and then you have to disavow, you have to dehumanize the people that you're conquering or colonizing. Um, it's, it happened in India, of course, right? The colonization. But then uh, even in France, the diaspora that we are seeing in France, um, uh, initially France went out there all over the place, right? And, uh, and took over places. Whenever I come in as the new big power, right? Or I'm taking over, or I'm trying to get resources um, as a country, um, I have to, I have to psychologically not, not even just, oh, yes, racism, but psychologically as a person, I have to say it is okay for me to take this. It's okay for me to appropriate it as mine. And the only way that I can do that is for me to say, you are less, you don't deserve it, you don't take care of it well, or any, you know, any, any, any sort of thought that follows that, um, that sort of that line of thinking, right? So if we have to do that, we have to dehumanize, then it makes it okay. And once it's okay, guess what? That's a privilege I'm not going to give up easily, right? I deserve this. And we've taught that to generations. Uh, that's not even a conscious process necessarily. And we're going to talk about the model minority myth. So we're moving into the area now of stereotypes, specific Asian stereotypes. Um, and can you describe what some of those, like what is the myth, model minority myth? Because not everybody may know. Um, and also, uh, another stereotype you can help us to understand is a fetishization or objectification of Asian women um, slash the emasculation of Asian men or just this nerdy, you know, trope of Asians. Um, can you talk a little bit about what those stereotypes are, 
why are stereotypes problematic? Our brains are pattern making machines, right? They're pattern. And so that's why when cognitive biases come, like as in why stereotype, it's because we're scanning for danger and trying to create patterns as quickly as possible to get out of danger into safety. So that is why it, this is for the long run, because we have years from the time we're born built up all of these patterns of ways of thinking about other people, thinking about ourselves and the world. And so coming back to model minority, the myth. So how model minority even came about was um, a sociologist in the 60s by the name of William Peterson. And it was during the civil rights movement where he was trying to describe, uh, you know, the protests that were going on and Blacks were considered problem minority. And so he was using Japanese Americans. And of course, you would think he would remember they were interred during the war, but he called them a uh, model minority, right? To, use, to describe Japanese Americans that they worked really hard and they studied. And he was essentially saying to black folks, if you work hard and you study hard, like those guys, like those model minority um, folks, then you will be better. Your communities will be better. And what it actually started is that it pitted, right, Asians against Black folks right there. And so then, also for a lot of the Asians who were already, so then you have what we have at play is then because of this exceptionalism and, and uh, the closer to whiteness for Asians that we were suddenly given this status, you get what they call, um, racially valorized, right? You get um, patted on the back because you are doing what it fits to. So under white supremacy, right? Whereas white folks determine, right? How you rank, all of a sudden Asians moved up the rung because if you study hard and you stay quiet, you shut up and you don't speak out against what white people are doing to black folks, you're gonna get, you're gonna move up in power and status and finances, right? And so as a result, that's sort of how this began and why this is also a problem of why we have to look at anti-Blackness. And it maintains at the top why model minority is a myth, right? First of all, is because it harms people of color and it harms, it, it maintains the status quo of white privilege. And so, and then last, and that's why I think for so many of us, COVID brought this out that we recognized it on a deeper level. We have worked hard as a society or as a group, uh, right? Asians have generally just tried to be law abiding citizens. And now our elders are getting killed, are getting hurt. And just, you know, people who look like us, women, children, men are being assaulted because of their skin color, and we're recognizing it doesn't work. This myth is a myth because we did all the right things and it did not move us up towards safety. It did not move us any closer to being, to belonging, to being accepted, to being safe, and to having a shared sense of equity and power. And so you can imagine how for our indigenous folks here then, that this is what they have seen, that they were promised things and yet have seen none of it. If we believe in the model minority, that as long as you work hard and you study hard, um, that you're gonna gain things, what happens is, is that we fall under a different type of exploitation, right? When we look at it, right, and we see that here, we have been then commodified, which is another way that white supremacy operates, is that you turn us all into objects and workers and you're dispensable. Right, your humanity is not seen under something such as model minority. When you asked to speak to the fetishization, that, sorry, I can barely say that word, of Asian women, right? Because when you have global powers traveling, right, for war, women were then, right, once again, were also dehumanized in the sense that, right, they were seen as just needing to be products to be fulfilled for the needs of men, right? So there's also patriarchy that we're talking about. And there's also a lot of these other systems of oppression. Like you said, it isn't just race. So the fetishization of, of Asian women that was really apparent, right, in the Atlanta shootings, right, um, at Gold Spa, was that 
these Asian women, right, after all these years of being seen in the media, when, when we do even show up in the media, is just as these glorified, subservient, docile women who are going to meet every need of a man, and usually a white man, right, because it was a lot of the soldiers that were child. And then that is what gives them permission, is when we're constantly, right, framed in that narrative, right, as a commodity. Um, Fetishization is very much tied into yeah, the needs of the men, right? And it decenters who a woman is and her and and just um, and all of that. And so one of the quotes I was just going to say to you in Kathy Hong's book, uh, Minor Feelings, which I also recommend. I think a number of you have also read it, right? And her book is so powerful. But why this is also so hard and we're like, here we are, I'm listening to us, we're giving so much context, we're literally explaining ourselves. It's because first of all, when you are invisible and unseen, you have to start from this place of explaining everything about you, whereas white people have had so much history to yet yeah, justify their existence, to justify their reasoning for everything. And so we give them so much benefit of the doubt for everything they do, like what Sneha says. Whereas for us, we all just get lumped as this monolith when we're nowhere near, there's so much nuance on so many levels. And we haven't even touched on the intersection, like the, all the different layers of a person's identity. But she says, right, they don't see their context as, as the default. And so it's exhausting for us because we're now trying to create a new default that is not based on them and their views of us, right? Because that we cater our whole lives to be seen by them, to be interpreted well by them. And so this also plays into the kind of oppression that we are daily managing. So many things, no wonder our default is just to avoid and just turn the other way, right? Whether it be within ourselves, it makes a lot of sense that we are avoiding um, and fleeing and freezing and fighting, getting defensive. How do we cultivate this kind of deeper work when we have grown up in a culture that is not um, modeling that kind of vulnerable um, self-awareness? and we don't have the emotional language. And it is threatening to be confronted with, maybe I'm not all so good here. What advice would you have for our viewers, whether it be facing their own oppressor within or dealing with um, being a target and the exhaustion of some of these layers of existence that you're talking about? One of the things, especially if this is an area for our viewers that's so new, and it is quite daunting as you start beginning this work, um, practicing in low stakes. And um, what I mean by that is having these conversations with people that you feel safe with and processing um, through um, what you're thinking, what you're reading, and what you're you're seeing on the news or social media. Um, I think when you're um, when you practice in low stakes like that, it it helps you build those skills, um, and it gives you courage um, to have those even harder conversations. Like if you want to have bring those conversations in with coworkers, I mean it could even be with coworkers that you trust. Um, and so I think um, learning language and, um, and practicing that in, through conversations with other people that they feel safe with is a good place to start. Um, and just even, I mean, the, the books that, Hengzi, the, the books that you've been, um, you've been talking about and, and sharing with us, I mean, just reading, you know, like I think just educating yourself so you do have that language um, is, uh, is something that's important as you begin this work of dismantling your own um, biases um, and the stereotypes that you've held. I totally agree with Joyce. And, um, you know, another facet of 
coming into your, your own awareness, awakening, growth. Um, I think that's really important is around pacing. So there's this Chinese uh, proverb idiom called ba, ma, ba miao zhu zhang. And essentially it's like when you try to pick um, a, a very tender germinating um, a seed with the sprout coming out. And you're just saying, oh, I'm just gonna help you grow a little bit faster. And in the end, that hasteness uh, destroys the life of what was possibly growing. And that's something that was, uh, you know, given to me through, through my mom, who was constantly educating me through Chinese proverbs, <laughs> not to match a stereotype. <laughs> um, but again, for, for those that are, have grown up in a system that part of the sense of worthy to belong is to be highly intellectual and cognitive you know, is to, again, pace yourself alongside your understanding and deconstruction of white supremacy of racism is to allow yourself to really feel the emotions, begin to identify and name the emotions that surfaced and begin to come into, again, what Sneha was emphasizing before, the validation, the permission and to find the right language for you. You know, um, there's a therapy kind of motto. It's like, fake it till you make it. Yeah, feel free to use other people's language that you're hearing in the various media conversations, but also take the time to really um, discover the language that works for you to describe what's happening to you in your body somatically and what's happening through your memory work of going through the inventory of tallying through um, moments that you just disregarded as like, that can't be racism or that can't be sexism. Um, and then begin to shape with permission, with a sense of embodied, okay, I'm going to let myself cry about this, even though I feel like it's kind of like disenfranchised gray. I like, do I have permission to like, this is a big deal. You know, um, who's to say it isn't a big deal for you and your personal healing process. And so um, as I recall, learning so much through this very conversation. It's like firing, connecting the dots of a lot of memory and a lot of implicit scripts that's already like coming to surface for me. And going back to how Hensley was deconstructing white supremacy and um, bring like flesh and bones to the model Asian minority myth. Um, I just came to, again, realize there was so much implicit in my family system that's like wanting to be perceived as uh, this kind of superior immigrant group um, within so many different immigrant and refugee families that I was around. We were like, uh, our, my, our family was on welfare. So we had sub subsidized housing that then located us in the context of so many different diaspora groups. Um, but you know, there was also these implicit things that I felt was like, well, we're, we're Chinese, so we're going to do this. Um, they weren't saying do things better, but now I can recognize, okay, there was something that was competitive in how they framed that. And so now I understand the power dynamic. It's actually rooted in this very deep historic wound. Um, and also the construct of like, um, the schema that was like now still a default for me, the obedient child, the submissive woman, um, kind of wanting to be like no knowing the techniques to assimilate in what Hinsey says, white space, and also how to assimilate in my colored spaces. Um, you know, knowing that that's a technique, not just to survive, but also to feel worthy to belong in, in these very diverse spaces. Just what you've all shared, the pacing, knowing the language. And what I wanted just to quickly add to that too, is letting go of that perfectionism. Perfectionism is actually one of the tenets of white supremacy, but it's also an Asian culture, like mm -hmm. insanely, right? That exceptionalism, perfectionism, it's, it's like a, it's like that is, 
the thing, right? And that's what paralyzes people from doing this work is because we get lost and it has to be perfect. I have to be the perfect ally. I have to be the perfect anti-racist person or n not offending people, right? Like, and then you won't, you'll just shut down. Like I would, and that was my initial reaction to, to everything was, I just can't do this. I just can't do this. But I think that has um, helped me and to do it like in what we're doing now too, I feel is collectively. So doing the work together with like what Joy said, safe people practicing, but this too, just being able to, to, to have, um, to, to not feel like you have to do so much of the heavy lifting on your own is really critical. Mm -hmm. So how do we engage others in this conversation in a helpful and supportive way for all involved? So are there, how do we say start a conversation? How do we create some boundaries in that conversation? Understanding that boundaries are very North American um, compared to some of, uh, in contrast to some of the Asian values. Um, so can you talk about that? And are there times where it's actually not safe or not helpful to actually talk um, in a particular conversation? Is there times where it's wise to be silent? Well, safety is really important, right? Your personal emotional safety, like not just, yeah, when we say safety in, in therapeutic terms, it doesn't mean physical danger as we had chatted about earlier, but it's also your internal sense of safety. And for those of us who've come from cultures where there are no, we don't talk about boundaries, we don't talk about emotional safety, right? Because in a lot of collective cultures, it's like individualism is not um, seen as important, like you're part of a collective. And so, um, you know, how you feel is not always validated. And so sometimes if it's not safe and you know you can't keep yourself safe, I don't think it's worth having that conversation because it the cost is too high, and and um, and the and so I don't think that's good to put yourself in a position where you are in threat and in danger, and you also can't you know communicate clearly then right because then you're all what well, we also talk about all of your um, your autonomic nervous system kicks in to keep you safe and it is not about your thinking brain anymore so I don't think it's worth it to have those conversations if you're not safe I completely agree with Hengzi mm -hmm. with the safety piece that's the most important thing um, like from my own personal experience um, I've tried to have these hard conversations with family members and it's always gone south and so I have personally I have chosen not to have these conversations because it just is not an openness and a lot of the beliefs and biases are just so deeply embedded mm -hmm. and um so to preserve those relationships I've I've chosen safety yeah and earlier when we were talking about pacing ourselves and checking in like we have different capacities so mm -hmm. if someone has has more trauma around an area um that that might not be their their conversation to have or even i've just had a really exhausting week emotionally and so i just don't have it in me to have this conversation right now and that can be shifting for even within an individual right yeah, um that, oh sorry yeah, go, ahead, go ahead well no i just wanted to add again stress the boundary piece and like placing those boundaries for yourself, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's part of that's part of our own self care, especially mm -hmm. as we do this work. It's really, that's really important. So let's okay. actually talk about self care in this work. How do we do this in a sustainable way? Because this is here for this is like we're not going to dismantle it overnight, right? So talk to me about what that looks like for you. Uh, what that what you recommend to clients. Uh, I think, I mean, processing and processing this, with this, what's happened is part of self-care with people that you feel safe with. Um, and, you know, I know we talked about grounding and being centered. Those are offices that we can utilize as part of um, self-care. Also, um, you know, cul cultivating um, empathy around like the pain of it and the heartbreak of what what is going on is important um and just it's it's okay to to lean into that pain and to the 
to the anger um, and not suppressing it. It's okay to be angry about um, racism and what, you know, just what we're seeing on TV. Um, so I think leaning in is something when I'm, when I'm leaning, when I'm talking about leaning in, um, I'm, I'm talking about just allowing yourself to feel the emotions and like, and, and it's okay to enter into that space of anger because of what is happening. Yeah. And I, it also makes me think of when I first reacted to some of the Black Lives Matter stuff where I was like, I was uncomfortable with their anger. Yeah. And then I realized um, that that was my work that I needed to do and be aware of, right? Um, and, and it is important to be not just aware of ourselves, but also how we are um, shutting other people down. Sometimes if we're like, we feel so strongly oh. about something, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. And yeah. to just cool down and to just uh, be present in that conversation. It's okay to not be okay. Um, so giving, again, giving ourselves permission to feel uh, to feel frustrated, sad, angry, pessimistic, hopeless. Um, and also like offering space to others uh, to process, um, to do the same. I love what you said about just being okay with not being okay. Um, I think it's important to encourage um, people that it's that, that whole befriending your feelings and stuff. I think because as we've talked right, historically, generationally, we are not familiar. We have not been given permission to even be friends with ourselves, with all that we have lived, to be friends with our bodies, to be friends with our feelings and our thoughts and emotions, right? So starting from that place, I think is so, so critical because, right, you can't move outward to have action, to do anything. If you yourself are so uncomfortable with your own feelings about any of this, um, and also, Justine, what you just said, I appreciate too, because one thing I've had to learn is not to tone police, whether, and what I mean by tone police, it, that could be myself or others. If someone doesn't present their feelings and their emotions and their responses in a way that makes me feel comfortable, then I get defensive and I start policing them, telling them, well, you were too aggressive in the way you're crying too much. You're too emotional. So don't talk to me. This is one of the things we have to stop perpetuating because that is part of white supremacy that unless things are presented in a way that's analytical critical rational and abstract right people don't listen but no your emotions deserve a voice and they deserve to be heard and they shouldn't have to be packaged in a way for other people to be comfortable to receive it so practicing that within ourselves first right as self-care is so critical that I own my emotions I'm proud and I'm not apologizing for what I'm feeling and experiencing is is really really huge and one of the things that has helped me is a visualization that I do for myself is actually just reimagining all my my ancestors and my elders as well with me this is something that's a, a really powerful indigenous practice and I feel for us we have an elder honoring culture that sometimes has been stripped of us or is deemed not okay. Mm -hmm. We need to return to that, that for those to, to really own that those people who loved us, who have gone before us, who created and sacrificed, that they are with us now in our self-care process. So really taking the time to tune in and to be thankful for those people as you own your own feelings that they probably had and they couldn't share is to share and feel that for them now too. Yeah, I totally agree with Henzi in terms of beginning to invite yourself to build a broader kind of panorama around your story and the ancestral inheritances, not just the trauma that maybe we were um, passed down, but also the um, incredible resilient stories of our, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers. And now, as we come into some of the conversations that especially Henzi was able to kind of unfold for us, we see the power dynamics there that, you know, now as we remember, as we come to cultivate conversations with our mothers, our fathers, um, fam family relatives, um, yeah, coming into that appreciation for the hard memories and the good memories, the, the wins and the tragedies, and holding that complexity without trying to like 
you know, force yourself into like this, like enforced optimism about your life, but grieving as you must, you know, celebrating as you must, and just hold, hold that hot mess of yours. <laughs> So how can we have intergenerational conversations and be mindful of the different experiences that all of the generations and the cultures, and I don't mean racial culture only, um, but societal culture say that our elders have experienced in their lifetime, but also our children and our, the younger generation coming up um, who only say no a North American context. So how can we begin to have these kinds of conversations? What are the things that we need to be aware of? So I think one of the things for, for me as I work with people and even have conversations uh, is you have to respect where they're at, but also invite them to curiosity. And um, curiosity can look a little bit different at certain points. So many times when I'm beginning to have conversations about race, with people, they are very confident that it's not race. They're very confident. And I think um, questioning the confidence um, that they have that it's not race um, is important. It has to be done delicately, but it's important. How can you be so confident? How can you be so sure? How are you so sure? enlighten me, I, I'm being curious about their process. What if you were not so sure? What would that mean? What if you were not so confident that this had nothing to do with the color of your skin or the color of my skin uh, or the color of that, right? Like what, what if you were not so sure? What would that bring up for you? And is there a small part of you uh, as I'm asking this question that resonates or wants to run away from it. We don't have to keep talking about it right now in this space, but could you consider that maybe sometimes people don't deserve the way they're treated? And of course, everyone jumps on that bandwagon. Of course, life throws lots of things at us, but what if life is made up of people that deliberately harm you? Along with what Sneha says, I'm, I'm just also coming into trying to embody again what she's inviting us to, this idea of um, giving yourself permission to be curious about the experiences you've had, about the experiences that you witnessed or even within your family system has encountered, um, and knowing that it may not be comfortable. In fact, there will be uh, tension in the process of growth and self-discovery, self-awakening. Um, you know, one, one thing that sh she's also kind of modeling is just to, to know also your family system. Um, so I guess part of understanding internalized racism really is also to include um, and broaden our lens through trying to empathize how our parents and generations before us has encountered racism different than us um, to acknowledge what they have gone through. And so um, family system just means a way in which we see collectively members of our family, um, their behavior, their values that are both explicitly communicated or implicitly um, shown through different types of behavior. For example, how we may as a culture or as a family celebrate certain things um, and have taboo and never talk about other things. So that creates a value set that you learn um, whether you even are aware of it or not. Um, with that comes acknowledging within your family system transgenerational trauma. And so um, transgenerational trauma is the psychological term that describes trauma that is transferred between generations. And so coming into curiosity means um, like, for example, me um, taking the time to, you know, go for a walk with my mom and ask her how she struggled through um, experiencing racism. Um, having done that, I realized that more recently she's actually encountered more racism than I have as a, 
as a retired um, social worker that's lived in Canada for over three decades, um, she is consistently aware that she is being questioned if she belongs here. And her behaviors, um, as uh, for example, there was one time in which um, I think she, she did her master's degree in education, um, but I think because of her accent, as her strong accent, she wasn't given positions to, to teach um, that she felt there was a level of discrimination. Um, and so with that, I'm coming into a level of consciousness as I'm learning about power dynamics, as I'm learning about white supremacy, um, that she, you know, she throughout her life suffered from implicit racism that was happening systemically in her career that at this point in my life, my Asian-ness, my, uh, the way I look and I'm identified, uh, it serves me uh, as a privilege because I'm part of the model citizen myth. Um, like for her generation, if I'm taking the time to really stay curious and, and try to connect the dots here, you know, like, oh, okay, maybe she's, wow, like at the time, like there's like, a glass ceiling, there's racism, and there's like a baseline pressure that she also feels like being the model Asian in her generation was like coming into like knowing that she had to perform high as she wanted to be competitive and be that Asian person that did what the culture like expected her to do. But then she would never get into leadership roles. She would never get into management roles. She was to serve as what she was hired to do. Um, so I would say that learning different ways in which she's kind of chosen to survive in her system in her lifetime, then sometimes that, you know, may have modeled to me to stay quiet, to, you know, um, survive by just letting things go, which is, which is to say um, the flight versus fight response. What I'm learning too is um, not having the answers for everything because um, Abraham X can be in his book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he says a lot of really amazing things. But one of them was that he says, you know, oppression has an answer for everything, mm -hmm. right? And it's so true. So sometimes if we go into, come into these conversations, trying to have an answer for everything, you know, um, instead of like what you and Stay are saying, being curious, hearing the other people's lived experiences, we then perpetuate that oppression. And I struggle with that, right? Because I want to have an answer. I want people's opinions to change, right? I don't want them to think that way. And so I have had to sit back and say, I don't have the answers. I have to reconnect back to them in relationship and it's that humanization piece, right? Because in his, uh, Dr. Kendi's book also talks about when we dehumanize the other, um, anything is possible, then we can do anything to those people. And that is what we've seen happen. So even in conversation, I can then perpetuate violence against the other person when I have to, I need them to think the way I do, I need to change them. Um, I am no different then. And so that's been really powerful for me to sort of just know that I don't have all the answers. I really need to suspend my own judgments and I need to be in a posture of humility to listen when I'm having these difficult conversations with different generations and uh, people with different backgrounds. As to what Ia and Hengzi and Joyce were all talking about, especially when you're trying to have an intergenerational conversation, you might also consider um, saying or thinking about like it's easier, easier. It's less distressing to blame um, someone for them not um, somehow behaving in a correct, appropriate, proper way. Uh, it's less distressing to do that than to feel the tension of uh, you know them being a target. And also when we're in talking intergenerationally, uh, it might feel to them to 
to our elders. It might feel to our elders like we're taking up space, uh, making the air thick, as it were, with things that don't necessarily need to be discussed or, or taken up. And so I might encourage them to consider that there's always a cost, even if the cost is unconscious. Costs can be anxiety, can be feelings of inadequacy, can be a drive for perfectionism, can be paranoia about other people's intentions, depression. And those things would be an a literally a repercussion, an adaptive way to manage this thing that I can't talk about. And so even maybe um, sort of greasing the wheels ahead of time, I'm going to talk to you about something that's hard. Um, but if we don't avow it, these are some of the ways that it gets expressed in our bodies and our minds, because we are in fact experiencing this. Mm -hmm. So how can the Asian community develop in the work of anti-bias and anti-racism work? Um, how can we learn to use our voice and our privileges um, to mm. advocate for ourselves and for other people? So how do we call others, especially if we are in positions of leadership where we are just labeled as, well, that's your thing. You can do that on your own. How do we influence the systems and use our, learn to use our voices in that context? I think just um, taking the question really broadly and like stepping back for a moment first of, yeah, like do we understand when, once again, when people say, well, that's just you, that's compartmentalized sort of thing, right? That, that logic, what I'm hearing is the person doesn't understand their own context or their own history or your history or your context at all to say that, right? And um, and so I think what's really important to begin with is, is first of all, learning to be empowered, uh, empower ourselves by knowing our own history, our context, right? Having the language and, and all that, it has to start from that piece, right? Because otherwise what it is, what that person is saying when it, well, that's just about you, they're always then saying and starting from a point that we all began equal, that everyone had equal access to, uh, to resources, to privilege, to opportunities, but that's not actually the case. And so because we want to address that, we want to bring about a true sense of equity for all people and inclusion, right? We have to understand that we don't all start from that same point. But if we don't know what from what point we start, you can't even begin to have these conversations. And so I would encourage people to first of all take, and I'm doing, and I say this because I'm I'm doing this. I'm still doing this now. I've begun this and I will continue to be doing this for the rest of my life. Is to take an inventory, first of all, of like who do you who do you associate with? Right. This is something my one of my mentors went through with me, looking at my inner circle and outer circle and and then just the people um, beyond that that I deal with of like, are, are these people, do they all sound like me, look like me, share my faith, share my sexual orientation, my gender expression? Um, are they of similar age? Are they of the same socioeconomic status as me? Right. All those things play into them right, and understanding of how we know our context and history. And so if we are only hearing, like I like to say, like I only grew up hearing white authors, right, white people speak. Um, I didn't know then, right, um, what, what that means for me to get active, because then it, it doesn't make sense for me to do any of this work. So knowing the circles you run in, who you're around, that's a huge point. And then seeking knowledge and understanding from from people different than you. So for me, it was broadening to not just read white authors, watch white movies, uh, white news and have all, it was just like from authors, like indigenous authors, black authors, Asian authors of, from, you know, and reading and really understanding the lived experiences of people who are very different than me. I'm realizing this is so important for us to start getting active in, even before we have lots of outward action, because that's that's the piece that often gets missed so good and i think there's also that element of of 
when you're talking about knowing our own story and our own perspective, it's hard when you're swimming in it. And until sometimes you have a contrasting view that gives you that light bulb moment of, oh, the, not everybody thinks like that. Um, case in point, the news that you watch is coming from a very strong perspective, whether you realize it or not, um, and tells the story from one group's benefit more than another, right? Um, even with the, the news, um, any of the new racially motivated news right now, that's one of the most infuriating things is when they do, sometimes they pin it on the system, sometimes they pin it on the individual, depending on which one is going to make their story um, fit their narrative better, right? So just be becoming aware of those narratives, whether it be media or family narratives or cultural narratives or workplace narratives, et cetera, um, is hard work, but essential, a good starting point. That these are things that we, if, if we don't sort of somehow explicitly name as well are why we're even having this conversation because there is a power dynamic at work. There are not everyone, right, has the same amount of power. We all have some power, but it's not the same for everyone. Um, so after the first Asian conversation circle that we hosted, one of the themes that came up was the sense of people not feeling comfortable taking up space using their voice um, being heard and how validating it was for them. And as I shared this on an Instagram story, a white uh, Caucasian friend in the chronically ill community um, engaged with me and she was like, thank you for saying that because there are times that I've been told to sit down and shut up in the, dis in the disability community where there is that hierarchy that's happening of comparative suffering of while well, I'm black and I'm disabled with this particular illness and this and it, it it just didn't sit right with her because it invalidated her experience and so then I followed up with this um, thought that I learned from one of my other conversation circles so all of our experiences are valid however we experience them however small t trauma and disturbing and distressing it was for us or big t trauma that we have experienced. And we need to be able to use our voices to share our story. But it's not always appropriate everywhere to share that story, either because it's not safe or because you are part of the dominant voice in a group. And so when you are in a room, when we find ourselves in a room, to just be aware of the power dynamic and who's sitting at the table in that room. And if we are in the dominant group at that time, that is a great time to be even more aware of when you speak and how you speak and how often you speak and how much you're speaking and to be intentional about listening to the voices that are not as dominant in that group. And vice versa, if you find yourself in the group that is more marginalized, typically in that space, then that is a very good time to exercise and speak up. And I found that guideline very helpful because of that oppressor and oppressed that is always happening. There are certain places where I am the only person in the room that looks like me and other places where as the Asian who likes to use my voice, I can be the dominant one and take over. The extrovert comes out and I'm not making as much space for other people in the room. And so I think just that, that question of power, where is the power in the room? Or when you read a story from the news or watch a film of some kind, where is the power and where is it flowing? And where is the attention being drawn? And I, yeah, and I think if you add intersectionality into that, because I know that's actually a, probably a really important term tying into that, Justine, like you said, because if you don't know the intersectionality of your identities, you won't know where your power lies. But Justine, you so clearly communicate that you know in certain areas, this part of your identity, this particular identity can show up within power but not so much in another circle. And so I think if we could define the intersectionality as well, 
right? And it's just that idea, right? That Kimberly Crenshaw, right, talked about in her work. It was out of for you know um, black feminist sort of viewpoints, right? Is that you are not just one thing. None of us are just one identity. Right. Um, all of our identities are made up of an intersection and, and that's how oppression and being oppressed can happen. Right. Is based on right whether it's your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, your gender expression, uh, like your social economic status. Right. So all of those have you have privilege and you have bias and you may be oppressed in any one of those areas. And so I think that would be critical if we can add that to the conversation. There's kind of two components that um, that I'm experiencing feeling. One is that practicing my personal advocacy as an as a therapist and as an artist, how do I use the, the this level of knowledge um, kind of uniquely through through the arts to be able to express certain dynamics that uh, that I feel is happening through through my my deconstruction of racism so i'll i'll share an image that i i've been working on that is uh still in process um, but as you can see um there is a person facing a mirror and um there's a bunch of different parts uh people in that mind that is pulling at invisible strings um, and so here I'm just trying to express some of the inner dynamics I feel of like, I can't, I'm trying to name what the strings are in terms of my triggers, which, uh, which is to say, um, going into an inventory of my personal experiences and remembering um, experiences in a new lens of awareness and being like, oh, actually that was a trigger and that's how my body responded. Um, and then also how my family taught me how to respond um, and renegotiating the, their voices, their behaviors with what I now want to embody. So self-advocacy, self-care, I think go hand, goes hand in hand for me um, in terms of seeing myself more truer, uh, fighting for the truth of who I am today, now, in my body, through my body. Um, and, um, and in terms of like advocacy when it comes to kind of the social realm, um, again, I think, first of all, permission for those people that um, may easily feel guilty that they're not participating in the work. Um, and not everyone um, needs to uh, kind of be visible or very vocal in order to, um, you know, really embody the impact. Um, I remember me and my mother went to the uh, protest at uh, the arts gallery for anti-Asian hate crime and um, my mom wanted to uh, definitely see what and and hear all of the different voices and um, you know it that's one way to participate she you know she obviously wasn't one of the speakers but by even just witnessing it's already part of the advocacy work I was actually just the driver to get to downtown because we don't want to pay for expensive parking, but I legally parked and we were able to go together for a while. Um, anyways, um, so for, yeah, for some people that have power that they're aware of, the privilege of making systemic differences, we spend most of our time at work. Um, if you're not in private practice or in a, in a smaller kind of business, um, you may be in a position in which I think, you know, at in this point in time in, in, our, in our awakening societally um, to, again, as uh, Henzi's talked about policymaking in a previous conversation, you may be that person now to be able to implement new policies to transform uh, hiring practices, to really look at the glass ceiling and see if there's any um, racially um, implicit uh, hidden rules at hand that needs to be deconstructed. Um, but obviously, um, I think everyone has, has, has different experiences, different place in, in their world um, and responsibilities. But uh, just to kind of 
if you are in that position of power and you're coming into this awakening and knowledge, um, I think it's, it's an amazing opportunity to um, embody the truth that you now know. I love it. And first of all, thank you for sharing your art with us. I actually really want to see more of it at some point. Um, because, yeah, the, I think part of it too is it's so important that we engage in ways that, that, are, that are true to us, right? And for some, it is going to be through art. Some it's going to be um, through protesting and that the really physical out there sort of expressions. But for others, it could be as simple as like writing a letter you know, to your politician, right? Yeah, having those conversations, volunteering, being the person that, I mean, right now, I know we're still in COVID, so we can't, but if we were like the person who sets up the chairs in a place for people to talk, like every little bit counts, yes. right? And I just want to say to people, like, it's not, you cannot do this work if you think it has to look like some, like, like once again, while we're doing this work is because you are not someone else. You are you. And you are alive at this time with all the gifts and all the uniqueness that you have to bring your best, to be your, to be who you are um, in, in this, in this difficult work, right? To be light, to um, in, in a way that's going to be unique to you, right? And so I, I thank you for sharing that, Yeah, because that's that's exactly it. I think when I talk to people, sometimes they feel like, oh, well, I, I don't want to, I can't protest, you know, because I'm like a front lines worker. And I'm like, well, you don't have to protest, but, you know, you could do this and this and this, right? Whether it's also donating to causes, right? Don't, if you have the financial means, donate, right? But it's just, there's the beautiful thing of what, of the time we live in now is that there's no shortage of ways to get involved. And it is just, taking that first step. And that's what I'd love to ask our viewers is what will be your one first step, mm -hmm. right? For yourself personally and for yourself um, actionably, right? Because it's just one step, one thing. It doesn't have to be 10 in order to get started. And I would actually encourage don't go for the 10 steps because that will quickly overwhelm you and it will, you'll go into the flight and the freeze and all of that and the avoidance right um so in any work of change whether it be changing a personal habit changing a, a personal perspective um or whether we're going for social change it's going to be many of those little choices of showing up and speaking up which we spoke about earlier in practicing in safe places and going from there um and i really appreciated just how you highlighted to experiment and to find what that expression is going to be for you uniquely um, and understanding that it's going to we're not going to get it perfect all the way through and to not let that fear and that shame to stop us and it's so easy as asians to tiger mom ourselves um, and that's that harshness is not going to actually result in long it, you're going to take so many more steps back um, in taking that approach. And so that's really our encouragement to you uh, today is just that one small step. And we just thank you so much again for your valuable time and your presence here with us today. And we are with you and cheering you on in your ongoing journey as well. Bye. Bye. Bye.